Welcome back to the Banger Bar, metal fans, metal heads from around the world. This is the new edition of Lock Horns from Banger Films, where every week we pick apart, tear apart, rip apart, and try to stitch back together our infamous heavy metal family tree we created many years ago for our film Metal Ahead Banger's Journey. Just some quick reminders, subscribe to Banger TV and check us out on Apple Music where we are now the official metal curators. If you're watching this on the YouTube archive, a reminder we are now at a new live time and that is 5 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. Okay, this week we're going way back in time to the 70s. Does anybody remember the 70s to talk about the new wave of British heavy metal or popularly known as Nawabum, and it's one of the most important influ influential branches of the heavy metal family tree without question. And to help me out will be the esteemed metal author, Martin Popoff, who knows absolutely everything about Nawabum. So take him on. We're looking forward to locking horns. But before we bring Martin out, we're throwing to a band that you may have heard of. Check this out. Hello, we're back. It's live, people. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining me, hey, Mr. Parapop. Good to see you again, Sam. For those of you that don't know, Martin and I have been working together for many years, since the very beginning, in fact, and it was Martin and I who constructed the beast that is the heavy well. metal uh, family tree. Um, You've written some books on this stuff. Tell me about it. Yes, I have. I guess I've written a lot of heavy metal books, but I do love the new album. So we've got, uh, we, we did a, uh, a, a reviews book of 900 new album uh, records, and it's kind of a cheat because probably 100 of them are, are uh, full-length albums and the rest are singles. That's a big thing about the new album. Yep. And then we've got an extensive timeline and quotes thing, Wheels of Steel, and this means war that goes through uh, the years of them. So it's, cool. a, it's a handy little trilogy. You know, covering uh, 79 to 84. Very cool. Hand those to me because yeah. you're going to okay. need your hands free because it gets okay. dirty on this show. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> how did you get into the new wave of British heavy metal? Tell me that story. Well, just, a, you know, a kid in the 70s, you know, only loved heavy records. You know, you'd, you'd go to the record store, you'd risk on records, you'd see them, you know, guys with long hair, and then you'd make sure there were no flutes or keyboards and stuff, and the song sounded a little violent or whatever. Yep. Um, and sometimes those would be heavy albums and sometimes they wouldn't. But... Yeah. Uh, you know, eventually this thing comes along. Uh, I grew up in a small town in BC, so we went to Spokane, Washington, and that's where you buy uh, imports. It's strawberry jams and magic mushroom and eucalyptus, all these cool uh, head shops. Um, uh, Sounds Magazine was out, uh, eventually Kerrang! And, and, you know, they started getting these imports, uh, full-length albums and singles by baby bands. That's a big thing about this, right? right. That These are new bands for, for, for kids right. who right. are into metal. And they're looking metal. You know, when Maiden sure. comes out, it's got, it's got a monster on the cover right. and it's a cartoon. So these are, these are the first records that we're seeing that were like unapologetically heavy metal. They, sure. they, you know, they looked like heavy metal yeah. albums. Deep Purple and Black Sabbath albums did not look heavy metal. Right. right. We'll park it there. Like we got else, some so. really important stuff to say in this episode because I agree with Martin that this genre, in fact, may be the birth of metal proper, yeah. metal as a self-identified culture and form of music. So in some senses, we could actually say that metal begins with the new wave of uh, British heavy metal. Anyway, some mm -hmm. housekeeping. As you know, this is not all about us. It's also about you. The chat is what keeps this show moving and locking horns. And I want to give a shout out to everyone joining us uh, today. We've got people from California, Kansas, Montana, and Texas in the US. We've got people from Finland, Poland, Netherlands, Denmark, Wales, Malaysia, welcome. Iceland, I'm going there next month, can't wait. <laughs> South Africa, Iran, welcome. Ottawa, Vancouver, and London, Ontario, where apparently, and this is a first, 
They're throwing a lock horns party. We want a photo. Send it to Facebook because that is hilarious. Um, most importantly, uh, when you contribute, we're going to be talking about a lot of bands today. We don't want to hear just the bands that you feel should be added or deleted, but we want to hear why you feel that way. Off camera, as usual, we have the mighty Lisa Latasur, who when she rings this sound, sorry, it means we have to shut up and move on. Okay, good. Let's lay some ground rules, uh, uh, Martin. Okay. What is the new wave of British heavy metal? Well, you know, I, I would say, as I was saying before, these are these are new younger bands coming up. It's also, it's got a little bit of that thing happening from punk where there's a lot of independent singles coming out for these bands before they get record deals, if they get record deals. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden there were a whole bunch of bands which, uh, like I say, you know, the records looked like they were heavy metal records. They, they didn't have ballads. They didn't apologize for not having ballads. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very bluesy. They're picking up on the pace of things. Th these are bands that are influenced almost by like a second wave of metal, mm -hmm. uh, starting with like Rainbow, UFO, Thin Lizzy, Judas Priest, those kinds mm -hmm. of bands, rather than your Sabbaths and Deep Purples from mm -hmm. earlier on. So everything's a little faster. You know, there can be keyboards. It can be a little epic. Yep. A lot of Rush influence. There's a yep. lot of progressive uh, influence yep. as well. So so yeah, you're basically seeing um, the, these, these cool younger bands making records that are more or less heavy from start to finish. Let me jump in there. Uh, this phrase, this mouthful, this yeah. uh, mastodon of a title, yeah. Nawabum. Uh, how does it get this term, the new wave of British heavy metal? Well, so in, in May of 79, uh, Sounds Magazine, which was, you know, there was Sounds Enemy and Melody Maker. Sounds was the one that was sort of uh, championing the new heavy music. So mm -hmm. Jeff Barton is, is like the godfather of all this as a writer. He really, like, really pushed these bands. So mm -hmm. he was writing this long, I think it's two-page review of, uh, of Samson, Iron Maiden, and, and uh, Saxon, Angel Witch. Angel Witch. Yeah. Angel Witch at this show. And, uh, you know, really cool review saying, wow, there's this crazy scene. And then Alan Lewis, the editor of the magazine, in the in the subhead to the article wrote in the new wave of British heavy metal. And right. that's where everybody started calling it. Right. That. Very cool. Very cool story. It's not often we can pick like the origin point <laughs> yeah. uh, for a style of metal. It's usually a little more uh, confusing and amorphous than that. Um, but let's talk about the sound. You've talked a bit about the look and the sort of aesthetic. If you can boil it down, what in your mind are the specific sonic characteristics of Nawabo. Well, I mean, we did start seeing quite a bit of twin leads. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I picture in my head a lot of five-piece bands with two guitars. Mm -hmm. um, you know, higher pitch singing, you know, a little bit a little bit of influence from, uh, from uh, you know, Rob Halford more than anything. Sure. Ronnie James Dio as well. Yeah. So, yeah, faster, shorter songs, um, you know, a little bit of uh, what's going to become speed metal and later going to become thrash, yeah. right? I guess at this point, you know, a lot of people are calling some of this speed metal as sure. well because it's sure. a little faster. So a little more technical, yeah. a little uh, a little more progressive, um, and yeah, keyboards are allowed as well. And we talked a bit earlier about the look, and you know, when we did Metal Evolution, we also talked about how uh, it was the fans and artists at this time that were really kind of adopting a look that was breaking from the proggy or even deeper, the kind of 60s hippie look, and also was uh, doing something different than punk. So talk about the specific look that was emerging. Yeah, so, you know, the hair's the same as the long-haired guys from the 70s, yeah. but but there was there was a new uniform. There was either leather jackets or jean jackets. There were a lot of buttons, a lot of patches. Some of this is picked up from punk, but it becomes a uniform, you know, the, the, the tight jeans and sneakers and stuff. Um, so. Basically, you know the the uh, the bullet belts and the and the and the waist things, you yep. know, with the bullets on them, and and so uh, yeah, I, I I'd say it it got to a point where. There, it was definitely the punks versus the rockers now at yeah. this point, just like mods and rockers before. Well, yeah. you know, they, they were fighting between these two tribes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very important point because we sort of see these bands sort of shedding the rock look of the past and actually coming up with something with something completely new. Okay. We want to look at the current chart. So this is basically what we built. Right. Can you believe it? It was 12 yeah. years ago. <laughs> uh, we sort of identified these bands as being the most central or important uh, to, to Nawabum as a genre. And I think that we've had some debate, if I'm right, Lisa, from people in the chat saying that maybe we need to rethink some artists. Is this correct? As always, that's why we're here. <laughs> okay. 
Um, Motorhead. Yes? Is there some debate about Motorhead, Lisa? Is that where we want to start? Uh, yeah. Okay. We Let's do it. Jamie Farley. Motorhead is the definition of Nawabum. That's why they're first on this list. Artur F. Castana. Welcome back. Don't drop Motorhead. They were a part of a movement and the influence that they had in other genres is, is massive. Uh, Price Alexander says Motorhead was a pioneer of speed metal, but they belong here all the same. So there is some debate here. Yeah. as to whether a band, uh, the band Motorhead belongs. What are your thoughts? I totally believe they belong. Okay. I put them on the cover of my first new album book. Um, and uh, I think, you know, they, they, get, they get sort of told they can't belong because they almost start too early. Their first album is 1977, but that was on a different record label. It was a little bit of a weird album. Uh, you know, it had covers and a little bit bluesy uh, influence, but then they do Overkill and Bomber in 79. And that really kicks off the new album. There's, they, they've got a monster on the cover. They've right. got a logo that looks metal. Um, you know, the other reason I suppose people say no is because um, their sound is a little more uh, dirty. They've got a gruff singer. Um, the production's a little rough. But I, even there, I argue, um, they totally belong because they are actually an originator of a sound that does continue right through the, the new wave of British heavy metal right. with arguably Venom, but definitely Tank. Tyson Dog Warfare. That you know, there's there's this own little there's this little dirty new wave of British heavy metal thing that they started. So yep. they totally belong in this thing. They're they're playing with all the bands. They're on bills. They're either yep. backing up or headlining. Yep. Uh, they've got the look. They've got yep. the leather jacket. Everything. They totally stay. I I really almost think you know. And the funny thing is, when people have this argument, they either say they're the number one main band that should be on, or they should be kicked off completely, which is totally bizarre. Right. Well, I think you have some allies, Austin Mursraka. Uh, says keep Motorhead uh, rushed it on like that. Yes to Motorhead. Ariana Black, no Motorhead in here. Nawabum influenced, but more punk thrash. So there, uh, yeah, there's always been a bit of a debate around Motorhead, really where to put them, but it seems like people agree they belong. We're going to throw now to a clip from our friend Lemmy. Rest in peace, Lemmy. And he's going to give us his thoughts on genres and metal. Check this out. More like a punk band, really. I mean, if you shut your eyes and forget we, our history, then we are a punk band. It's more like a punk band than a you know, metal band to me, I always thought. Because mm. we, we always had more common with the damned than, like, say, Judas Priest, you know. Mm. But, you but we have long hair, so you see, we have to be metal, you know, it's <laughs> obvious. Did you see Motorhead as being... All right, there's Lemmy chiming in. So I think we kind of got some general consensus. We can probably move through Motorhead fairly quickly. However, there is one band which I think we're going to have to roll the sleeves up a bit more on, and that's uh, Def Leppard, of course. Let me read from the board. The Earthbound Lucifer says, Def Leppard to me made more impact after distancing themselves from uh, the Nawaba movement and becoming more of the pop metal trend. Now, Jason D says, High and Dry is about as Nawaba as it gets. I spun that as a young metalhead as much as I did Maiden. And Cat's Metal Litter Box, awesome, says that I agree Def Leppard should be off. So, some division here on Def Leppard. What do you think? Yeah, okay, so Def Leppard, part of the problem is they get on a major label right away. They just seem to be on a different path, although they do have some singles and stuff. Um, and it's not even a very metal label, Polygram. Um, but, you know, I, I would argue, they also, they also distance themselves a little bit from the look as well. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of dressed up a little bit. Um, they, they, you know, were very vocal about, about not saying they belong. But, I mean, I just, I totally agree with this comment that High and Dry is, is totally new album. Right. But even more so, on through the night, I mean, you, you draw a line through all these bands and right smack in the middle, like not strange in any way at all, right. totally belonging is on through the night. I mean, right. it's, it's, the, it's the quintessential new album now. But they got super famous later, right. and that's what we know them for. Right, so. well, we've got some more comments here. Scott Witt says, no to Def Leppard, they don't want it. And I think they're associated just because of timing. It's like Tesla getting lumped in with hair bands when they're closer yeah, to the black growth. Well, good maybe point. we'll come back. We'll pick up on the Def Leppard uh, conversation. But I actually had the opportunity to talk uh, to lead singer of Def Leppard, Joe Elliott, about this specific issue. So let's listen to Joe. I know an Irish band, a French band. It's, I mean, they, they actually put trust in there. They were from France. I mean, you know, it's just stupid. Most of those bands were all from London. Um, so again, we didn't really belong anyway. The, the comparison that I, I've always used is like the Beatles wouldn't have been wanted to be 
known as something from the Mersey, you know, Mersey beat, you know, the Mersey sound. Yeah. They wanted to be the Beatles, and, yeah. and I just wanted Def Leppard to be Def Leppard. Yeah. I wanted us to be. So as I always say, Martin, I've never met a musician that likes to be categorized. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure yeah. you feel the same way. Yeah. I think the issue here, and maybe you could speak to this, is that obviously the Def Leppard that most people know is, uh, you know, the Love Bites Def Leppard, yeah. the, the Photograph Def Leppard, which yeah. is a far cry from Fist and Quartz. Yeah. So uh, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even by the third record, they don't even have a new album sound. And they're right. using that very new high-tech, um, you know, drum sound. They, they basically sound like an American band. So, yeah. so I'm perfectly fine with, uh, you know, if we're going to do a little switch here, I think that's the band I would yeah. zero in on. Uh, to consider cool well we got some more comments here mr totally off the hook says as much as people like to hate on def leppard for going full glam pop their first few releases are superbly no album real split here on through the night is no album agreeing with yeah. martin through and through jay williams chimes in on through the night and high and dry are both relevant to no album so yeah. as we like to do maybe to just stir up the little pot <laughs> we're gonna move them over here we're gonna put some question marks because right. we love the question mark. Although I suppose if, I mean, I think the question we always like to ask is, if we're taking a band off, do they belong better somewhere else? So are we saying maybe Def Leppard belongs in pop metal, in your opinion? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, they're, they're one of those first bands, say 1983, 1984, yeah. ground zero for hair metal. And, yeah. But of course you have the problem, they're the only band from Britain right. in that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. well it's a fascinating story and the guys in Def Leppard, as you know, have uh, strong opinions about that. So let's park Def Leppard for a moment. Uh, we want to hear from you if this troubles you. Like if you're not going to be able to sleep at night. Because Def Leppard is no longer Nawabum, and you know it's official. If it happens here, it's official. So uh, make sure you express your opinion. Uh, but what we always do on the show is uh, allow our esteemed guest to add a band uh, you feel is missing. So right. tell me, Martin, who is this band? I think the best band to add would be Samson. Okay. Um, because okay, they, they are are actually considered to be. Uh, the band that had the first new album single, I believe it even goes back to 78, maybe Telephone Man or one of those. But mm -hmm. they, they put out a few singles before they even had their first album. And their first album is even super early. Right. And Bruce Dickinson's in the band, which is kind of cool. Yep. And, they, and they do have a, a bit of that sound. They have a look to what's going on there. And I would argue by their third album, um, Shock Tactics, it's Bruce Dickinson's best vocal performance on an album. That thing's an absolute new album classic. Very cool inside knowledge. Yeah, Check it and out. then and then of course you know Bruce bolts and he goes on to bigger, bigger and better things. And then but Samson is still there putting out all those twelve inch singles and seven inch singles we all love in the new album. They get a new singer, Nicky Moore, and they put out another great album before the storm. And then they put out Don't Get Mad, Get Even. This is all by 1984. Right. So they're in there participating. They're fairly famous. Lots of albums, lots of singles. Good stuff, um, you know, even more stuff out than some of these other bands. Well, you have an ally, David Chacha, says not only was Bruce Dickinson in the band at one point, but their early material is Nawabum material. Yeah. Uh, do you think they tend to get forgotten because of the Maiden thing, or did we just leave them off because we ran out of uh, room way back well, then? Well, <laughs> I, I think it's partially because we ran out of room, but uh, and also they're a very fragmented band with, sure. you know, the, the Bruce era and then the other era, um, and, and they even got kind of bluesier later on, but uh, but they're there, they're on all those bills, they're playing with all these bands, they're, they're a pretty big Okay, well, John, Juan M. Q agrees with you saying that Samson. So we want to hear any other opinions about Samson. But Lisa, I think we want to turn the page, perhaps talk about a little more contentious band. Yeah, so the one thing that um, people can't sleep about is the omission of Judas Priest. Okay, all right. The omission of Judas Priest. So you and I both know this. Judas Priest is an enormously influential band. Yeah. You know, if we were to pick maybe the five top influential bands on our entire chart, Priest yeah. would probably uh, be on there. Uh, so 
first of all, give me your thoughts on priest. You know, why or why not might they be included here? Okay, well, why not? I mean, they started in 1969. The first album's 1974. They got like five albums out by all this, by the time all this is happening. So they're clearly from another era. I would argue they're from that second wave of metal era. That's the big thing. Right. Um, you know, but, but why to put them in? You know, I, I have also this list when we do articles and stuff about honorary new wave British heavy metal bands. And they're kind of like an honorary one. Priest could be in here the same way Black Sabbath in the Heaven and Hell era could be right, here. Yeah. Your I Heap could be here sure. for Abominog. Right. Um, who else? Budgie can be in here. Right. So there are bands that participate that are a big deal. The big thing about Priest and, and why people might say should they be put in here is because um, their coming out party is essentially British Steel. And yep. it's 1980. They're still a relatively unknown band. You know, British Steel is just another name for New Wave of British Heavy Metal. You know, it's got the iconic Razor and everything. And yep. this, is the, this is the band that, that um, starts having big anthems about being metal. Take right. on the world and all that. The look, the yep. leather from, from head to toe, all the guys. Yep. So there's all these reasons they should, you know, they're important. Um, but I think they're like, a, like an honorary New Wave of British Heavy Metal band. You, there's no way you can put a band in here that started in 1969. Yeah, well, I think you make two really good points there. I think, one, people tend to forget how early Judas Priest started, how yeah. far ahead of the game, uh, per se, they were than a lot of the bands on, yeah. on this chart. And secondly, and I remember talking to Rob and KK and Glenn about this in Metal Evolution, is that I think they got a bit of a, a push from the new wave of British heavy yes, metal, absolutely. because this was a band yeah. that had put out several records, yeah. but then by the late 70s, early 80s, they're seeing bands like Maiden and Motorhead, Diamond Head, et cetera, yeah. uh, become quite popular. Yeah. So they definitely um, rode that wave, yeah. uh, so to speak. Let's go to the board. We've got some comments here, Lisa, f about Judas Priest. Yeah, take a big inhale first, because there's a lot of comments. <laughs> oh, try and uh, summon up the lungs of yeah. Rob Halford uh, for this. Here we go. Nicholas Ottaviano, hello, sir. That's a good point. Yeah. Says, if you're going to call Nawabum the birth of metal proper as we know it, then you have absolutely no reason to deny Judas Priest. This is a good point. They absolutely represented metal as it was known in the 70s and 80s. They were the guys who stood up and said, were metal. Yeah. It's a very important point. Mr. Totally Off the Hook says that I am I the only person who realizes that Priest had like four records before Nawabum took off. Good point. If anything, they were between the first wave and Nawabum. Martin, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. Daniel Merwin, personally I think we should concentrate on the new in New Wave of British Heavy Metal. If Priest predated this wave and are continually referred to as riding the wave, they don't belong. Man, you guys have been studying this shit. We need you guys on the show. Motor Venom says Priest wasn't New Wave dum dums. Mm, Uncle Draggers. Priest was First Wave. Thank you, Jared White. If you don't add Priest, I will send a Viking raid to Canada. <gasps> Heavy I'm load. scared now. I need to breathe. Arthur Felipe Castanha says that one could argue that Nawaba made them. Nawaba made Priest the gods that they are known for as today, British Steel, Screaming for Vengeance, and Defenders of the Faith are all made in the Nawabum era. Chief Holston lastly says, how is Priest being included even in question? They have to be put in, man, come on. It's interesting, I mean, just by putting them in here doesn't make them important, but lots of good points there. Anything you wanted to uh, Yeah, to I, I think you're seeing possibly an interesting thing where people are looking back a lot of years and these are younger people who are not, you know, thinking in the same compressed timelines that, that we all are. But I mean, I, I really think the bottom line is, yeah, they had four or five records out before this all happened. Right. They literally started in 1969. Their first record is 1974. Yep. You know, to us, they were, they were almost like an old, old band by the time of British Steel. I mean, I just love those 70s records. I think they're those three records in For a row sure. there starting at Sad Wings are three of the best records. Maybe there's time. an argument here that Priest was slightly ahead of their time. You know? Oh yeah, and absolutely. They were doing, they were yeah. creating a sound that was faster, more metallic, yeah. leaner with the soaring vocals, all the things we've yeah. been talking about before the world was ready for them. Rob, yeah. you can take that quote. You got it, man. <laughs> uh, so maybe we should at least uh, to, to stir the pot, let's at least put Judas Priest <laughs> up here and um, see what happens to the internet. Um, maybe we'll slot them in and just see what happens. There is an eye in Priest there. It isn't Judas Prest, okay? It just ran out of room. <laughs> Judas Prest. 
Nice. Not impressed. Uh, okay, we got Judas Priest out of the way, Lisa, for now. Yeah, but Should you, have we move a, on? you have a bigger problem. We have a bigger problem than Judas Priest? It's Satan. <laughs> that is a big problem. <laughs> Centuries old, in fact. Okay, yeah. Satan, of course, is not just a dark lord that we all fear in the night. It's a band. Uh, Fabio Mainieri says... One more is missing. The criminally overlooked Satan from Newcastle informed in 79. Home of Venom 2, of course, which sometimes gets slotted in right. with the new wave yeah. of heavy metal. Yeah. Uh, the band is considered influential for playing a fairly advanced form of thrash slash speed by the standards of the early 80s. Okay, the earthbound Lucifer. Satan needs to be added because of their work in both the Nawabum era of the 80s and present day. I think he's biased based on his name. Ah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. There's, they're related somehow. Banger rules! Exclamation mark. Thank you. We do. Satan wasn't a band that disappeared in the '80s, and I believe that that fact makes them really relevant, not only for their early work. And Rick Adams uh, says Satan needs to be on that branch. Just seen them at Maryland Death Fest a few days ago, and they kicked ass. And lastly, Anna Sofia Cardoso says, if you don't add Satan, I will tell Russ and Brian Ross that you forgot about them. Ooh, tattletale. No one likes a satanic yeah. tattletale. <laughs> Satan. Give me your thoughts. Well, I, I think really, unfortunately, we're we're now down to the thing where we could probably find 20 bands that are tied for that that sort of slot. I think Samson right. is clearly way bigger of a band here. I mean, they had one of the first super collectible New Wave British heavy metal singles, but they really only had one album come out, uh, Court in the Act, uh, during this time. Mm -hmm. They really weren't that much of a part of the conversation um, mm -hmm. because they weren't participating to the same degree. Yep. I mean, they came later, and right. then the, the Motorhead stuff, I mean, the the Metallica, sure. you know, influence, uh, sure. you know, helping their career, and they kept going. But no, I, I don't think so. I, I would, I would still probably find three or four bands ahead of Satan. So if Satan them. went anywhere, if we were to categorize them somehow, where, where do you think they would belong? <laughs> They're just part of this. They're just they just happen to be more underground. Right. I okay. mean they're okay. they're together, they're breaking up, they're together. Right. I mean people kind of know them, their reputation has grown a little more over the years, Got but it. they're pretty underground. Right. So they just they're they're certainly part of this, but perhaps yeah. uh, there's other bands uh, yeah. ahead of them in line. I guess I mentioned the V word, Lisa. Uh, Venom. Thrash Maniac 99, where is Venom? Uh, Brian Osorio uh, says Venom should go in Def Leopard's spot. And Brad Ennis, Venom, should at least get a mention. Now, when I sat down with Mantis for our Extreme Metal episode, we talked about this very issue. And he yeah. said that they, in fact, didn't see themselves as being part of that um, because they were obviously doing something much more uh, aggressive, far yeah. more extreme. But w what are your thoughts on them? I, I say they're almost basically tied with the whole Samson situation. They're okay. they're on neat records. Yep. They're from Newcastle. They're playing fast uh, stuff. They're, they've got double bass drum going. Um, you know the the whole satanic aspect. There's a, there's a few there's a few bands that are into this. Witchfinder General, um, yep. Witchfind, um, so a Demon. Um, so yep. you know they I think they do kind of belong and. The reason they don't belong uh, is because they're too good. I mean, it's that whole thing with being, if you're super, super original, um, right. no one knows where to slot them. We, right. have that, we had that problem all the time with Pantera and King's X, right. and we have it right. here with Motorhead, and right? And Priest Same is thing probably, with Venom. Priest is a similar yeah. issue. Um, well, there you go. Venom, we're gonna put them over to the side. For now, we'd like to hear a few more uh, con comments about Venom. Uh, I mean, my opinion, not that anyone cares, but too bad is that they don't belong mm. for me they were um creating something that was that was uh distinctly different than a lot of these other bands um and paving the way for for something uh completely new but obviously mm -hmm. everything comes from somewhere so there's going to be some dna yeah. there that's shared but ultimately i think uh they need to be somewhere else let's see what uh people are saying alex schlosser says you can make the same case for venom as for motorhead they were an enormous influence for thrash slash extreme metal, but their sound was still in the wobble. That's an interesting comparison with Motorhead because mm -hmm. they definitely had yeah. a grittier, yeah. faster thing going on. Uh, Jessica Fisher, welcome back. I was also going to argue Venom, but then I realized they were on a different branch where That's they true. fit better, though I honestly uh, put them in thrash slash speed over Proto Black. So to your point, yeah. some bands are so important that maybe they belong in more than one place. 
Yeah, more than one place, or you also have them on a different uh, different branch yep. as well. And, yep. You know, we can't really put Def Leppard as easily on a different branch as we could put Venom. Right, right. Yep. This seems just too low. Judas Press. <laughs> well, they're probably the biggest influence on Daniel, this entire you can get that genre. In the shot. Right? Judas Pressed. <laughs> you know what else is Birth too low? Birth and Yes, Lisa. You know what else is too low? Iron Maiden. Uh oh. Someone mentioned Iron Maiden. M.K. Delin says, why is Iron Maiden not at the top? Well, if you really want to know the answer, which is a boring one, is that when Martin and I put this together, we're like, how the fuck are we going to organize it? Well, we organize them in order of when their first album That's right. That's came right. out because we yeah. needed some yeah. semblance of organization. That's right. So that's why Maiden is not at the top. It's not yeah. to suggest that Motorhead is more important, but... Uh, look at all these bands that put out records before Iron Maiden. Yeah, there was metal before Iron Maiden. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in case uh, you didn't uh, know, so there's there's your answer. I told yeah. you it wasn't very interesting. <laughs> uh, but there's some other bands, Lisa, right? That people are starting to. There's a, uh, there's a few other names coming through. There. Okay, Witch Find. Yeah. Gabe Hughes says that Witch Find should definitely be on the list. Uh, they were there at the beginning and had three very important albums. Uh, tell me about which one. Definitely. Um, they, they were, you know, they had one of the first scary albums with the, you know, the satanic goat on the cover, yeah. Give Him Hell. And then they had Stage Fright. Uh, they had uh, Lords of Sin, Cloak and Dagger. So they had four albums out essentially during this era. Yeah. They were all very different from each other. They had a weird kind of eerie poppy sound, but they were also satanic at the same time, at least for the first two albums. But good stuff. Um, they started in 1975. Mysterious, crazy band. You know, yep. the lead singer, uh, the leader's name is Montalo. And so they're, they're basically, um, they have enough material out, singles, albums, to be a, a huge part of this thing as well. So, sure. I had to check the, fa the spelling on this because the last thing I wanted to do was pull out another Judas Press. Uh, so yeah. there you go. Which find? I mean, I think what we're clearly, now I've put them under the question mark because I think really what we're dealing with here is that I think we've lost sight of how much of an explosion of music this was. Yeah. I mean, we're really talking about a fairly short period of time. Yeah. What, three, four yeah. years tops? Yeah. And there's, this is like, this is a big bang moment. I think yeah. people, we, there's hundreds of bands here. Yeah. Am, I, am I right? Yeah, that was the great thing. If you were into hard rock all through the 70s coming up, you know, I was starting around 73 moving forward. All of a sudden, there were all these great albums to buy and you knew they were going to be heavy and you knew you weren't going to be disappointed because the front cover had that cool illustration and the back cover had the crazy live shot on it, right? Yeah. So, so th that is the big thing and why we even have this. It's because, you know, some people say it wasn't one sound and I guess we're proving it's not one sound, but it was a whole bunch of baby bands all at the same time. Exciting time. Sometimes if you're old like us, you were there. Ha ha, you weren't if you're a young whippersnapper. Whir anyway, there's more on the board. Afreen Khalid says that Witchfinder General would fit into Nawabum considering they formed around the 1980s, but their sound was more doom metal. And Fabio um, Mainieri is back. Witchfinder General, General was part of Nawabum, maybe not so important for the subgenre, but they are widely recognized today as one of the pioneers of doom metal style. Thoughts mm -hmm. on Witchfinder General? Well, I mean, these guys aren't even hitting it hard enough. I mean, they're essentially the first doom band, period. I right. mean, if, if Sabbath invents it and you can't call them a doom band because they're Sabbath, Witchfinder General, the first band who, you know, dared to really sound like Sabbath, right. period. There yep. were no other bands in the 70s, right. really, that were down that road. So, yes, and they put out two albums during that time. They were kind of mysterious. They didn't play a lot of live gigs. Um, they, but, but they were, and you know, it's okay to have a different sound because because as I was saying with Def Leppard, you know, things come in from all angles. There's yeah. Poppy all the way to Doom, all the way to Venom, to Motorhead. But these guys are definitely the Sabbath band right. uh, out of all this by so far. So in your opinion, would they be considered more of a progenitor of uh, Doom Metal rather than Definitely. Metal? Like, yeah. Given that we have other charts, they totally sure. go on that Doom chart. Sure. They're literally the second most important band. And here's an Sabbath. interesting conundrum too, because we're actually dealing with a genre that's characterized by a period of time yeah. rather than a sound or in some cases if you think of uh, shock rock or perhaps goth, it's more of an aesthetic. Yeah. So it's almost like yeah. if you're a metal band in Britain in 1981 and you put out a record, 
yeah. someone's going to make an argument that you need to be yeah, here. for sure. Whereas, yeah. in fact, it might not be totally yeah. accurate. Yeah. Okay, bang of rules. Merton Papa, <laughs> sir, you know your shit. Good, uh, thank you. Checks in the mail. Antonio <laughs> Gutierrez says, I hope when I'm old, I become that dude. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Very cool. Dem focus on the dude part. He knows what he's talking about, mates. He sure does. Taught me everything I know. So, uh, good. Shout out for Martin. 400 books about metal? Yeah, well, something what? like that. 54, 54. <laughs> uh, how many uh, bands we got coming in here, Lisa? So, uh, Witchfinder General, just to back up. Yeah, you know, I, I finish... would include them, but they're a tie with all these right. secondary okay. bands where, okay. you know, we're saying, yeah. What we do know is that uh, witches were popular. Yeah. And uh, is there a band called Witch? Uh, there was an American band called Witch. Ah, yeah. There should be a Red band called Witch. Red Vine the Hex is on. Yeah, right. <laughs> which, which are we talking about? Which Finder General? Bear with me. Which Finder? Totally normal spelling on both words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My, my, my demonic script is a little rough today. My, 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 it's my, a little my Michelle apologies. Voivod there you got I know, it's all, I got everything I know from you and Michelle and from Michelle. Voivod. Uh, yes, Lisa? So for those people who don't like it when I interrupt you with the bell, I just want to note that I only interrupted a shot of your butt. Oh, so that's, I hope that's, that's okay that with everyone. That deserves an interruption, if anything ever did. Uh, which fighter general? So I'm blocking that out. So we're building it. We uh, have a bunch yes. of band suggestions, okay. but we don't have good arguments for okay. Praying Mantis, Grim Reaper, mm -hmm. Demon, maybe. Yep. So maybe, Martin, you give us your thoughts and the chat can get on telling us why we should add them or not. Okay, I'll yep. just go real quick. Demon, uh, just like Witchfind, they had this kind of eerie commercial but satanic sound. They had a really creepy looking uh, second album called uh, The Unexpected Guest. First one was called Night of the Demon. They certainly are in there. They turned into a prog band later on. Grim Reaper made one of the greatest new album albums of all time. Their first album, See You in, See you in Hell. Um, great, great sound. Um, uh, amazing singer in Steve Grimmett, uh, yeah. scary album cover with the Reaper and stuff, really cool album. But they, they kind of get to the party late, although they're on Ebony Records early, but 84, and then they move on and have right. a couple albums. The last one on there, I can't, Praying, Praying Mantis. Mantis, okay. So again, they're kind of like the poppier side, they got keyboards, they're a little bit more like a deep purple light. Um, but they have a lot of singles out, um, and and that they they're almost one of those bands that starts the demise towards it when this thing gets almost too commercial. They, nothing really happens with them; they don't really right. make it. Um, but they're almost like going that, down that same Def Leppard pathway, and even earlier than Def Leppard. So a here's pocket. a question: Not a British band. What about? Armored Saint comes to mind. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why that came up because they're obviously a California band yeah. um, and they're also a little late to the party. They're, they're almost okay. like one of those first power metal bands of, yeah. the, of the American definition right. of power right. metal along with right. Metal Church and right. even Metallica at that point. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. Okay, what do we got out there, Lisa? Any other contributors? Corbin C. just called it the first wave of heavy metal. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. And then you don't have to make it about... British band. That's right. So yeah. let, let's, let's sort of step back and take stock here. Breathe, everyone. This is a big one. Any of these bands, given that, you know, this is our charts, pretty solid. We really haven't moved anybody off except for Def Leppard. We added your suggestion with Samson. There's really no debate about whether any of the other bands uh, nope. belong. If you had to choose from these four, where there seems to be the four where there's the most um, chatter about, hmm. who would you move in? How many am I allowed? You're allowed one. <laughs> one. Who deserves to be part of the canon? I will go with Witch Find. Witch Find yeah. it is. Yes, yeah. I think so. There you go. Four albums, good stuff, singles, creepy, weird, definitely looks very heavy metal. Okay, yeah. very cool. Very cool. So I think what we're down to now is people want to know how we deal with non-British bands and non-80s right. bands. Okay, let's see what people have to say. Cody Breitsprecher says, Pagan Altar, in all caps. Pagan mm -hmm. Altar played slow, moody metal. During the height of Nawabam, the only thing released was a self-titled demo that went in circulation. Well, you might have just pointed out why they're not here, because we've always maintained that the bands that deserve the right to be on the chart uh, have to have some sort of uh, yeah, lots, catalog yeah. and, and depth. 
um, to their to their track record. Yeah. Uh, Joel Paulson, what about new bands that are carrying the torch? Okay, so here we're starting to wade into some new territory that I knew would come up. Yeah. Enforcer, Black Trip, and Katana are all keeping the sound true to 80s. Nawabum, though they are all from Sweden. Um, Woodland Wanderer, yes, maybe the genre should be renamed to traditional heavy metal. Interesting. So bands like Warlock, surely not Disturbed. They don't mean that, do they, Lisa? <laughs> Is that a different Disturbed? If Martin hasn't no. heard of them, they don't exist. Is there another Disturbed? I don't think so. Oh, no. I'm glad. <clears throat> Warlock's a bit disturbed. of a strange one. I don't know if I can too. handle two Disturbeds. Uh, where are we? Jay, name last. So please start a Nawatham. Nawatham. I like that. Nawatham. New wave of traditional heavy metal branch. Not a bad idea. Leonard Reibstein, maybe a new branch is needed. Motorhead, for example, could be the premier band in a speed metal branch alongside Exciter and Anvil. Yeah. Some, tr yeah. some, some validity there. Yeah. Also maybe strike the British from the name like you did with Norwegian black metal. It's a good point. And that way King Diamond can take his place <laughs> here too. Yeah, so let's talk. I mean, obviously going back to that famous article in May of 79, yeah where the, the term was coined. Um, but from a historical perspective, would it be more accurate to replace the B with the T? No, I, I think you just leave this and you leave it as a, as a cast in stone, magical time. It ends in 1984 with a full stop. And right. you know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with the idea of having a whole new branch come up. But you know, we, we already have, we have power metal. We don't have a speed metal branch. That's kind of interesting. But right. speed metal is also an archaic term that's really not used anymore. But again, you can bring them up for, for some of these new bands. Right. There's, you know, Canada even has a scene with Savage Blade and uh, and Striker and yeah. with Cauldron and Skullfist yeah. and all these bands. Yeah. So, um, so so there is something going on. But it but it's it's in pockets all over the place. None of the bands are very big. Right. Um, so. I don't know. It's almost like, you know, if, if you have thrash and you have melodic, a, a melodic traditional strain of thrash, it yeah. becomes the new bands of this. Yeah. If you have power metal and you gruff it up a little and allow the, you know, the five o'clock shadow on it, yeah. it becomes this, the new, new wave of it's this. It's a good so. point. As you're talking, I'm thinking of what Nawabum leads to in our chart. And, it, and, yeah. and, and I mean, it's one of these sort of mothers of, yeah. of genres yeah. in the sense that we get we get pop metal or glam yep. comes out of it, sort of leopard leading the way there. Yep. We get we get obviously thrash metal, particularly, you know, bands like Metallica, Slayer are huge fans of Diamond Head yep. and Iron Maiden, and you even arguably get black metal as well, yep. because um, you know, we know that not only uh, the guys in Venom, but guys like uh, Tom Fisher uh, yeah. from from uh, Celtic, Celtic Frost, Frost yeah. was listening to that music mm -hmm. as well. We got some yeah. comments up here though. We should look at Corbin C uh, says when you add a specific region, it becomes a scene and not a genre. Interesting point. Good point. Fucking wasted says no wabum is a movement, not a genre. Okay, and brutal hobo. That's terrifying. Uh, says uh, Nawabum is very much a time and place movement. Newer bands are cool and carrying the flag and continuing the sound and perhaps belong in their own subgenre. But Nawabum is Nawabum, no question there. Yeah. I forgot to mention power yeah. metal too. Power yeah. metal is an outgrowth Huge. Yeah. of this as well. So in yeah. many ways, we're sort of we're saying that you know we could probably look at the first one or two bands of each of those other subgenres, yeah. and there's an argument why they could belong. Yeah. Anyway. But the but the big thing is that directly out of this time period, thrash is the huge one. Yeah. I mean, Anthrax and Slayer both started almost as more new album bands than they they For sped sure. up based on Metallica yeah. and hit the lights. Hearing that being inspired by either the demo or the hit the lights on Brian Slagle's Metal Massacre thing. Yeah. So so. But all of those thrash bands, those big albums of 84, 85, 86, it was super, super influenced by this and some fast punk. Absolutely. So, so you know, th thrash is, is the big, big uh, lead off. And of you're reminding one. me, I mean, when we did the Nawabum episode for Metal Evolution, uh, mm -hmm. we actually talked about that time. I remember sitting down with the guys from Tigers of Pantang and, and Phil Collin from... Mm -hmm. uh, from Def Leppard and that time when the American bands kind of started to yeah. take the torch away. If yeah. you were like, oh, yeah. we, we forget yeah. that there was a band called Motley Crue. Yeah. 
uh, that was creating some pretty badass metal with yeah. the, 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 that early record. So there was a sense of maybe that the, the British thing was kind of short-lived. I mean, most of oh, these yeah. bands did not, correct me if I'm wrong, did not make it out of the early 80s. Absolutely. I mean, Maiden totally made it out and did the same thing forever. And so they're like the, the you know, the champions of this whole thing. Yeah. Saxon keeps going and makes lots and lots of records. But sure. the big thing is, what happens is, Kerrang! magazine always loved American pomp metal, AOR, melodic right. rock, whatever you wanted to call it. So they they um, reviewed all that stuff and and revered all that stuff. So right. so when this American stuff started happening, you know Van Halen's another sure. big one. Sure, great at, example. At that time. Yeah. So so seventy eight first record. Yeah. yeah. The, the long and short of it is this thing closed with a clank of the door, and and the whole scene moved over to California, where you know that was the golden period of metal. Be it the thrash from there, you know, less or so, but yeah. hair metal and all those forms of like more mainstream metal from you know 83 all the way to like 91 it was the golden era of metal but that kind of metal and only over there this this just like they just turned off the lights yeah with and as we as you say with the exception of maiden uh leopard and priest too i yeah. mean i i mean granted they're it's it's really the british steels of the catalog that are recognized yeah. but let's not forget that they continue to make great records yes yeah. lisa I believe the lights are dimming here in the Banger Bar also. Is that right? Well, <laughs> Mr. Popoff, how do you feel? Well, it looks pretty good. We made a few, uh, we, we fine-tuned it a little bit. We, yep. uh, we brought up some bands. At least people know why there are certain bands that aren't on the list. You know, we've talked our way through them. You can only yep. fit so many, right? There you go. A moment in time. The yep. album. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Yes, very cool. Thank Thanks you for, for everyone for joining us this week on Lock Horns. Join us Next time off camera, I want to thank Lana, Dania, Daniel, Lisa, and Andrew. Also a reminder that we'll be back next week at this new time, uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m. And we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to do our favorite metal albums of the first half of 2016. <coughs> Abbott! Anyway, but we'll save that for next week. Thanks for joining. Subscribe to Banger TV. Check us out at Apple Music. Goodbye.